Agile for Humans is brought to you by Audible.com. Get one free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash agile. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player, including Scrum, The Art of Doing Twice the Work in Half the Time by Jeff Sutherland, and Crucial Conversations by Carrie Patterson. Visit www.audibletrial.com forward slash agile to enjoy your free audiobook today. Processes and tools dominate today's agile discussions. But we are devoted to the individuals and interactions that make it work. From the beginner to the veteran practitioner, we have something for you. Welcome to Agile for Humans. All right, welcome to this week's episode of Agile for Humans. I'm your host, Ryan Ripley. Joining me today... A, uh, a longtime co-host of the podcast, Amitai Schleier. Amitai, how are you, sir? Very good. How are you? So I'm great. Where are we at on the baby countdown, Amitai? We are entering the third trimester as we record. So uh, come summertime, there will be a little half annoying child of indeterminate gender that will have so many of my behaviors immediately that it will be annoying. Wonderful. <laughs> right? That's I, how it works, right? The world isn't ready, but uh, it doesn't have a choice, right? <laughs> it's, it's happening. The project it's is on schedule. Wonderful. And uh, best wishes to you and your wife. So what Amitai has done, Amitai again has stepped in and he's challenging Don Gray for the role of booking agent. He reached out and, and, and connected uh, me and the show with Lisa Crispin. Lisa, thanks for joining us. Oh, it's great to be here. I love listening to the show, and it's an honor to be participating in it. Well, thank you. I I love your books, and I know that many of the people out there have read uh, Agile Testing and more Agile Testing, the the books that you did with Janet Gregory. I think we'll get into those into a bit, but uh, I am equally thrilled. So this is a, a truly a great pleasure for me, too. So thank you. So what we're going to get into, there's there's this neat thing going on. I, th- I think we've talked about on the show before where Amitai and I are co-presenting uh, a talk at Big Apple Scrum Day. But some of this co-presenting, some of these ideas, uh, at least for on Amitai's side, and, and then when we've talked about it between ourselves and we decided to, to submit, I think a lot of the co-presenting actually started when Amitai and Lisa teamed up for a talk. And I was hoping that since I know we, we talked about a little bit of that stuff in the past, but maybe you guys could go into, you know, what is it about co-presenting that seems to be, you know, coming forward in the community? Uh, what led the two of you to it? And, and how did your talk go? I could tell my side of the story, but okay. I'm pretty sure I was not the target audience for who your offer was for. <laughs> so maybe you can fill that in after I'm done. Okay. So the way it came about uh, is that I had been doing, uh, there was an online training uh, sort of a learning community run by a fellow named Pat Maddox named Ruby Steps for people who wanted to learn Ruby. And I think mostly it was for people who wanted to learn programming by means of Ruby. But for me, it was I had been working in Perl professionally for five years and I wanted to just catch up to something reasonably modern. And so I'm already in there knowing TDD and how to work in a pair or a mob. But this language is what I was trying to learn. So I had that as a background. And then it was some Friday that I was working from the co-working space and Lisa put out a call on Twitter. You know, I'm, I'm on one of these days at work where they let us spend some time on whatever we want. And I'm trying to get this Ruby script working. Can someone help me out? And I had this really, really difficult time deciding in my head, should I raise my hand because I don't know if I actually know enough Ruby to be helpful? On the other hand, if I do, this could be really nice. Uh, and so, you know, I said, I think that we could pair and let's do some screen hero. And, uh, I got a couple hours. Let's give it a shot. And I think it was, it was more than zero helpful. And that was sort of the background of the background. Then what happened was maybe a month or two later, uh, agile roots, which is a really nice conference that they put on in Utah. And hopefully they'll be coming back to it this year. They took a year off. Uh, they put out a call for proposals, and Lisa put out a call for pairs, either on writing the proposal or on presenting it or both, generally targeted at people who hadn't done a lot of conference speaking before. And I had not. I had done maybe one or two. And I just thought, yeah, that sounds 
pretty great. I would love to at least get some help putting a proposal together. And if I could be so lucky as to, you know, put on a talk or a workshop with her, that'd be amazing. So I did and they accepted it. And we put on a workshop that I, you know, I kind of made up on the spot for that audience, which I've then since gone around in other places like the Agile Alliance Tech Conference, uh, other venues as well. And I think I can say without exaggerating that that little decision I made that maybe I do know enough, Ruby, I should offer to pair with you because it might actually be nice for you. And then maybe someday it's nice for me was extremely nice for me. Maybe one of the more fateful, intelligent decisions that I made in my career. <laughs> oh, that is so nice. And I'm sure you would have had a speaking career with or without that. But um, but the pairing on the Ruby skirt was incredibly helpful for me. I was feeling pretty sorry for myself because it was hack day for our team, but nobody on my team wanted to hack with me. <laughs> so, uh, so getting help on doing a script, uh, which was going to be an example to put out uh, for our customers for to help with support so that they could better use our API. Uh, I was glad to get get traction on that. And thanks to Amitai, that got done. And interestingly enough, it later got it turned into a real feature in the product. So, yay. I don't think I heard about that yet. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. Cycle time report. Woo. Uh, but I pairing years ago, I became frustrated that many conferences that I would go to it was the same people every time, and often at some conferences, most of the presenters were vendors or consultants or somebody who was there basically, you know, of course they were educating people, but they were mostly there to sell themselves. And uh, I just felt like we need some fresh voices and we need some diversity. And I found in talking to women who had not done a lot of speaking that they felt like, oh, I just, I don't know enough, or I, I'm too scared to do it, I don't feel confident, or I don't have any unique ideas. So, I, th um, I think actually it was Deborah Pruce who gave me the idea of pairing uh, with, offering to pair with people to help them get started in speaking. So, I started every conference that I was going to go to, I started asking around to see if there was a newbie speaker, preferably a woman, I'm sorry, but just because we didn't have that many women speaking at conferences then. Uh, but really, any newbie speaker that I could help out and, and once they've done a session at a conference, they've got a better chance of being accepted to more conferences, they've got experience. So, um, and it's actually worked out really well because just about everybody I've paired with has gone on to have quite a quite a speaking career. So and and that's helping everybody in the community. So I'm really excited about that. But it was particularly fun to pair with Amitai. I'm not sure about how much help I was because the topic of our workshop was DevOps Dojo, I think, and I couldn't really contribute much to the content. But um, hmm. but I mean, I had some ideas on you know how to structure it and how to do exercises and stuff. And what I loved is that on the day it was just a complete. Oh, let's do the complete improvisation. <laughs> but everyone yeah, had a I great audience. <laughs> it was earlier in the day that I was putting the finishing touches on the sample code base. And yeah. I can say for a fact, I don't know a ton about DevOps either. But uh, what, I, what I had a lack of confidence about, the pairing with you gave me the most confidence about, was I'm going to have my hands full trying to get this material understood and passed through. And I'm not going to be able to concentrate effectively on facilitating, even if I were good at it, which I wasn't sure that I was. And I knew that we were in good hands because you could concentrate on that. <laughs> right. And that's something exactly. that you know very well how to do. And I could learn from that. And I did. Yeah. So, I, you know, I think that pair presenting is a better experience for participants. And I know that for me, when I pair with somebody, I do a lot better job of, of preparing and, you know, rehearsing and practicing and and putting good exercises together and having good materials because I don't want to let my pair down. Uh, so, you know, it's a win all the way around. And, and since I started doing this, there are other, there are other organizations doing this type of mentoring, like speakeasy. Uh, and so I think all these efforts have really helped. And now we see women, not only on the program, but women keynoting, um, at conferences more and more. So this is great. And then lots of new people and people who add so much like Amitai. And Ryan, I know you're presenting at conferences too. So um, this is great. You know, we all need to share our experiences and learn from each other. And, uh, and presenting is actually also a great way to learn. So 
Yeah, I certainly enjoy it and actually had a similar experience where I reached out to uh, Diane Zajek Woody and she was she's a great speaker and, and does a number <laughs> of uh, feature spots. I think she does a few keynotes here and there um, is definitely highly involved in the in the conference community. And uh, I had many of the same insecurities and questions and and, and concerns that Amitai talked about. And she walked me through it, taught me how to structure a decent talk. Um, you know, the content's my fault. So if you didn't enjoy the talk, it's not Diane's fault. But, um, <laughs> but she got, and I think a lot of it is just breaking that inertia and getting through the, the initial fear. Because public speaking for me is fun, but how do you speak at a tech conference? And what's the process of submitting uh, a proposal? And how does, how does all that work? And since then, we've done follow-up shows with her, uh, people like Don Gray and some others who actually do reviewing of these submissions, and we've put some tips out there. But it's just such a big thing that if you've never done it before, it can be pretty scary to figure out, you know, first of all, do I want to get up on the stage? And if you decide that you do, how does that happen? And how should I structure it? And how can I be successful? So I, I definitely owe the majority of my speaking at least the ability to get up on that stage to Diane. And it sounds like Amitai got a lot from you, Lisa. And it just seems like that, that maybe that's a, that's a, a common cycle where it's, it's that co-presenting and, and helping that, that gets people going. And it yes. underscores the message as well. If, if, we're, if our message frequently in Agile is that collaboration gives us a better result, then we should expect to see that in the way the message is delivered as well. It makes a lot of sense that that helps. Exactly. So Lisa... So you're definitely not a stranger to co-working kind of relationship. Some of the, some of the best uh, books on... Well, actually, let's step back before we go into the books that you did with Janet Gregory. I think there's a story there about how the two of you started collaborating, how uh, all of that came to be, and what ultimately led to, you know, I think the, the Bibles on, on testing in the Agile community. And uh, maybe you could, could share a little bit about that. Yeah, that goes back to, to 2000. I I was working on my first extreme programming team, and the publications on extreme programming at the time were great, but they didn't mention testers. They talked a lot about testing, uh, but only some types of testing. And, um, and, you know, my team and I were just kind of figuring out what to do, and um, and I was on the extreme programming mailing lists asking questions and stuff, and in the end, I decided to to write a book on testing and extreme programming because so many people were struggling with it. And, and my co-author at the time for that book, Tip House, and I thought, well, at least we can share what we've learned and, and there are going to be more problems to solve. So let's, let's help everybody with these basic problems and we can all build from there. And I actually had asked Brian Merrick if he would help me with the book. And he's like, well, I don't have enough experience on an Agile team yet, but, but Janet Gregory has a lot of experience with it. He put me in touch with Janet, and she became basically the tester for our book. I would send her chapters and with techniques in it, and she would try it out with her team up there in Calgary, and uh, and she'd report back, or she'd tell me what they did. And so she basically helped us by being the tester for for testing extreme programming, uh, and then we started. Uh, presenting and writing articles together we really enjoyed working together and we were comp we have complementary skills so i like to write and um you know i have a certain experience with small high functioning agile teams and janet at the time didn't like to write <laughs> but she had experience more with larger companies and different types of software than I did. Like she had a lot of experience testing embedded software. Um, and she started to get experience with um, larger enterprise companies who were transitioning to Agile and the, the difficulties they were having with testing. So when my publisher asked back in 2008 if I would write another book, but call it Agile testing rather than testing in extreme programming, uh, something more general for Agile, I I basically bullied Janet into writing it with me because <laughs> she didn't like to write. But uh, that went that went really well too because her organizational skills meant that we had a great release plan to put the book together and get it reviewed by our peers and and uh, interview a lot of practitioners around the world and include their experiences in the book. So it all worked out great. And uh, yeah, it's really wonderful to have 
a collaborator who has those complementary skills and, you know, the sum of the parts is, is, is greater than the individuals or whatever that expression is. Would you say that in your time collaborating, uh, you've learned some of the organizational skills from her? She's learned to like writing a little better or anything like that? Definitely, definitely. I mean, I, I'm a lot more disciplined than I used to be. And if I do, you know, if I, a lot of times when I, when I pair with other people for presentations now, you know, I do the same kind of thing that Janet taught me to do. Let's make a release plan. Let's, you know, let's have two week cycles and let's plan what we're going to do each two weeks or one week, whatever it is. And, um, and let's stay on track and let's have these milestones. And, and it's also nice because you know that you're, if you get stuck, you've got somebody to help you. And so learning, learning the benefits of pairing in that way, I think that's been really helpful too. Is that maybe the biggest thing you learned from working together and for such a long and fruitful period is that when you can feel comfortable that your pair will back you up, you can learn anything else you want to learn? Yeah, I think that is. A, I mean, I haven't thought of it in quite that way, but I think that's true of any kind of pairing. If I'm pairing with a developer on the on my team and he's we're working on a story, I'm not much of a JavaScript coder or anything, but I can ask questions and the developer can explain to me what she's doing and why, and I can say propose different kinds of things to test. And uh, you know, I would never attempt to do any of that on my own. But when I compare with somebody, it's, it, it definitely reduces the fear factor. That's definitely my experience with pairing as well. There's kind of a, there's a learning curve to it. There's a skill to it. Uh, a, a fraction of it is specific to the kind of work that you're pairing on. Because uh, mm -hmm. I'm not talking only about pairing and programming, even though that's usually how I do it. Pairing in general. Uh, there's, a, there's like an 80% skill to it that is independent of what it is that you're working on. And then maybe 20% more that depends on the domain and the style of work in the workplace. Uh, and before you get over the hump of having that 80% skill, it can be very intimidating. It can depend really heavily on whether the other person's going to frighten you with the way that they might possibly <laughs> respond to something, or if you just think that they will. Uh, and eventually, this is my experience, it took me a while, and I, I can't put a finger on how it worked, but eventually I got to a point where it almost doesn't matter who I'm pairing with. I can be the way that I want with a pair and get more or less from them depending on whether they're giving me more or less. But I can I can be myself no matter who. Is that your experience as well? Um, definitely, and, and pairing on things that I'm most comfortable with, like testing or, um, you know, writing or presenting. I would say when I'm pairing with somebody who's who's writing co code, I still I still have a bit more of a you know, lack of confidence because I, I, I don't know all those IDE shortcuts. I can't work that fast, but I can still, I can still have ideas and I still know a lot of programming concepts and things like that. So I can still help. I know the domain. I, I have a lot of helpful things to contribute. So, you know, Lisa, one of the things I've always wondered about the, you know, especially the book writing process when there's co-authorship involved is, you know, how do you go about ensuring a consistent voice? Because I think we all write a little differently. We all think a little differently. And when you when you go to put those thoughts on paper, how do you make sure that 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 it's a cohesive kind of voice and it's a it's a consistent uh, kind of tone? Well, the way Janet and I work uh, is that, uh, especially like for the book, for either one of the books, like we we do two chapters every two weeks. So writing the first draft, I you know I would do chapter one and she'd start on chapter two, and we'd each work for a few days on that chapter and get sick of it and trade. And now I will start working on chapter two and Jan will start working on chapter one and we change and edit and rewrite things and we trade back and forth. And by the end of that two weeks, we've traded back and forth a few times, um, and then we put it out for review with our wonderful volunteer reviewers. And um, and then so then it's, it's going to go through a couple more rounds of revisions. So each time we're going to keep trading it back and forth. Now, we feel like we did a really good job of, of writing with one voice in the end because we can no longer ourselves remember which chapter, gee, which chapters did I start with and which ones did Janet start with. 
But my our friend Mike Tox claims that he can tell who wrote each chapter. So I don't know. It's hard to <laughs> test him on it because I can't I, I can't remember myself. So <laughs> he said I can hear I can hear when it's your voice or Janet's voice. So Well I can't. So maybe I, we're not as successful as we thought. <laughs> no, no, no. They, the the books are wonderful and uh and the reason I ask the question is because it just comes across as just a unified voice on on testing and and the practices. And so I was just curious, how do you maintain that, especially when you have, you know, as you talked about, you know, you're two people with two different skill sets and you complement each other. I think, as you mentioned very well, and and you guys brought it together uh, beautifully. I mean, the books are are, are very well done. So I, I just oh, I, was, thank you. I was fascinated on how you bring two, you know, you take two very interesting viewpoints and put them together and you make it one and it. You know, thanks for those insights. Yeah, and we definitely got a lot of help from from the wonderful practitioners who reviewed our content, made suggestions, and and also wrote their own sidebars to contribute to us too. So um, it, it was definitely it takes a village, for sure. So we are we're talking about for those that um, that may not be familiar. So Lisa, uh, along with Janet Gregory, wrote um, originally wrote Agile Testing. And so that came out uh, a few years back. I think you guys did an update here in the last year, or was it 2015? Well, uh, Agile Testing came out in 2009. Okay. And More Agile Testing is a completely different book. It's not an update of the first book. In hindsight, we should not have named it that, but we thought it was really funny. Um, And, you know... And I think what makes it more confusing, other people like Mary Lynn Manns and Linda Rising did fearless change, and then they did more fearless change, and more fearless change is fearless change with more patterns. <laughs> so it's got all the original content. More agile testing has none, has very little of the same content. We refer back to agile testing. Yes. Um, and then we do use a lot of the same models that we talked about, but but we also like the quadrants, the agile testing quadrants, which we which we learned from Brian Merrick and used kind of as a basis in the first book, agile testing. Uh, over the years, uh, more Agile testing came out in 2014. So over the years in between, people had had adapted those models, which is great. That's what you should do with models. And so people have all kind of new takes on the, the Agile testing quadrants and the test automation pyramid from Mike Cohn. And so we included all that in the new book. But uh, but it is it, it goes. There were so many areas of testing we did. You know, even in 550 pages in Agile <laughs> testing, we could not get into. Plus, you know. Technology changes so fast. Uh, mobile testing wasn't such a big deal in 2009. I mean, people were doing it, but but it had really grown exponentially by the time of the second book. So, um, and, and that's one reason we had to round up so many. We have 40 different uh, contributors who wrote sidebars for the book because Janet and I are not experts at mobile testing. We're not experts uh, at testing that we have experience, we're not the world's experts on testing and distributed teams and, and different things like that, different specialties. So we tried to have chapters for different contexts that people work in, uh, for different types of software, and how do you, how do you test them in an agile context? Uh, so, yeah, it's it, – and, and we revisited some topics, but in more depth. Like, more agile testing didn't have a huge amount on exploratory testing, and we have a lot more of that in more agile testing because um, agile teams have gotten – uh, more understanding of exploratory testing and the value of it. So, um, just as we've learned things, we had a lot more to put in that second book. Yeah, it's definitely a different book, and I think what the two of you did is the right thing to do in our industry, especially. And as you noted, that information changes, practices change, and if you're going to do a refresh, that may not be the best way to go. But it, this rewrite. Uh, I, I think it, it did expand the knowledge base, and it, it's one of those that if you're in on an agile team and you're writing software and testing is important to you, right? If quality is important to you, I think these are two uh, two books that uh, that belong next to you as you're as you're trying to write your 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 testing strategies and, and your plans for for your application. So, really appreciate that. As far as a question came to oh, mind, go ahead if I could jump in. I, when I was hearing Lisa describe the books and what's in them and the rationale for the new one, it occurred to me that as someone who spends a lot of time developing uh, and then coaching and consulting also, I have a lot of ideas in my head for uh, examples of things that I wish that product managers and project managers and people managers and testers and developers and executives would understand about Agile from the developer's point of view. 
that as a developer, they're things that we just know because we live in there, but seem to be not commonly understood and really hamstring us. And so I have a bunch of things that I wish those people would understand about developing. And if I could give them one, I try to think of one. So I'm wondering if as a primarily tester, are there things that people who aren't testers should know about testing that they seem to not know, even though it's really fundamental to how testing works? Maybe one or two really common ones or things well, that come I, to mind. I think the most misunderstood um, type of testing among agile teams is probably, or any teams really, is exploratory testing because people confuse it with ad hoc testing. And I am not an expert in exploratory testing. I can do exploratory testing. I'm not the best person at teaching it, although I'm working on that. Um, but, you know, people like Elizabeth Hendrickson and James Lindsay run rings around me on, on that. But um, people don't understand that it's not just about banging on the keyboard. There's a place for that. There's nothing There's nothing wrong with ad hoc testing or monkey testing, but they are for different purposes. And exploring is to learn about our product and learn about our features and uh, think about, you know, try to try to overcome our cognitive biases that make us want to see what we expect to see and try to get away from that and look at the software from a new perspective and how it different people use them and people doing different jobs and people in different contexts. And so the techniques of exploratory t- testing help us overcome the biases and do a better job of finding the critical things that are either missing from our product or uh, are not working like people would expect and are not delivering the value that the users of that software need. So I'm getting the- confirmation bias from your answer as it happens <laughs> because it, it makes sense to me that the reason that exploratory testing would be what's misunderstood is that it has to do with uh, a, a theory of knowledge and what we think we know and what we why we think we know it, which is often a place that people don't want to go. They just want to keep it simple and we think we know means we know and that's good enough. <laughs> And that's the exact same sort of epistemological problem that I run into as a developer of any schedule that we may set or uh, any behavior that we assume the software has or, you know, anything. It's, it's, a, it's an eternal dance with what we think we know, how recently we knew it, why we thought so then, whether that's still true now. And that's a whole forest that a lot of people would prefer to just pretend isn't there, that our house is actually in a nice little suburb. But our house is in the forest, and we're moving through that forest all the time. (laughs) So it suits my confirmation bias that that's the same kind of thought problem that you would see in testing. Yeah, and I think another thing just people do not realize, they don't think about all the types of testing that there are to do. They're more focused on functional testing. And that may not be the most important quality attribute of your product. Maybe performance is more important. Uh, security might be the primary thing. You know, usability, there are just lots of different types of testing, reliability, you name it. And that's that's why I think the Agile Testing Quadrants model has been so helpful in so many teams because it helps them remember or identify all the important types of testing they want to do and plan, you know, we need to make sure we do performance testing Let's do an architecture spike and do performance testing right now before we can, and rather than waiting to the end before we're going to release and realize our architecture did not scale, uh, for example. So uh, I think that's another area where people, where teams need help. So along with, mm-hmm. with the books, I, I believe you've, you're also bringing a lot of this information to video format. Can you talk a little bit about that, Lisa? Well, Janet and I just recorded a video course on Agile Testing Essentials with Pearson, and that should be coming out in May, I believe. And it's about five hours of just the basics of agile testing. It was kind of hard to to distill down what we thought would be appropriate for that time format. And also the challenge, and people seem to like video courses these days, they're popular, but Janet and I are big fans of training from the back of the room. We feel like all that theory of how humans learn actually is true and we don't learn from somebody just talking to us we have to do things and try things and practice and talk about them with each other to really learn them so one of the biggest challenges of the course was to build in exercises and um and so we we after about every few minutes of talking about something uh, and showing a few slides then we give people an exercise to do pause the video and then when they come back then Janet and I talk about how we would have solved the exercise or how we would have approached that 
whatever we ask them about. So we hope that that'll make it a, a good learning experience, even though it's a video course. You know, it's interesting that, that testing has really come to the forefront of, of software development. It seems like uh, before the agile days, you know, back in, in the dark times, it used to be, you know, the developers would write the code, then they would throw it over the wall to QA. QA would, would, would enjoy the, the process of, of thoroughly testing and breaking the code and maniacally laugh as they tossed it back over the wall. And, <laughs> and there was this, you know, uh, this kind of animosity or, or almost competitiveness between the groups. And now uh, we're breaking through those bounds. Are you still seeing, though, some, some of that old mindset where it's still, we're, we're having trouble getting the, the programmers to test their code. We're still seeing these siloed off QA departments or these QA teams or, or the one tester on the team who's, uh, who's cl- clearly a, uh, who, who inevitably becomes the bottleneck, you know, those kind of patterns. Is that still prevalent out in, in your guys's, you know, for this is for you and for, for Lisa and Amitai, is this still prevalent in your practice or are you seeing people coming around to the notion of, cross-functional teams, testing is everyone's responsibility, those kind of, those kind of mantras? Well, first of all, in defense of Waterfall, um, the dysfunction of the, of the throwing code over the wall and hostile relationships was certainly a thing, but I don't believe that we can blame it on people doing a Waterfall process. Um, I worked on a Waterfall team in the early 90s, and the developers automated pretty much 100% of their unit tests. They were not doing test driven development. We didn't know about that then. I'm sure some people did. Um, But they had excellent automated test coverage. They even were required to write unit test plans, which I think was a little overkill. (laughs) Um, And we had continuous integration. We had automated delivery to, I think we had a couple dozen test environments on different flavors of Unix. Um, We had automated tests. We didn't have a really anything at the we were data we were testing a database. We didn't really have an API as I recall. But we did have some UI testing to do and we did that uh, with on with the automated tools available at the time. And we got involved at the very beginning of the project as soon as, you know, as soon as the design or whatever the first phase kicked off, testers were in those meetings and we were in the analysis meetings and we were in the, you know, all the meetings about talking about how are we going to develop this thing and implement it. So we were involved throughout the cycle. And yeah, it was a six month or one year cycle. And that was fine back then for that particular product. And, you know, we didn't have critical bugs in production because we were delivering a high quality product. So, so good development practices are good development practices and they're not, and they're not new. Right. Um, but, but I do feel like there are more healthy teams <laughs> out there uh, I still see I still see companies where they evaluate performance of developers by how many bugs they introduce and they evaluate performance of testers by how many bugs they find so guess what <laughs> there are not going to be good relationships there uh, the the and I see a lot of cross-functional teams I guess the most common problem that Janet and I see especially as bigger companies are transitioning to agile and the, and that decision comes from the top down rather than the bottom up as it used to oh we're going to do agile okay you're all on these cross functional team now teams now okay testers you're on these teams you're part of the team now uh, we've let the QA manager go uh, and uh, good luck so they do nothing to support them <laughs> they give them no training they they give them no clue as to how they might do it. Whereas the programmers might actually get some training on TDD and refactoring and continuous integration and, you know, different practices. The testers get nothing. And so they're scared. And they're also told that, oh, well, we need some test automation here. So if they happen not to be coders, then they're scared they're not going to have any kind of job. And they just kind of hide in a corner and hope nobody will notice them. And that doesn't help anybody. So I do, I do still see that a lot. But, I, you know, I think that there's a lot more awareness. Obviously, everybody cares about quality. Um, if they really understand why they should invest in it, then hopefully they will realize they need good professional testers in most cases to help with that effort and provide them that with, the, with the support and training they need. Yeah, I still see uh, maybe, it's a, maybe it's selection bias based on the kind of work that I'm doing, but I still see way more teams 
that are not like cross-functional teams than teams that are. Uh, and I think it is it is a particularly long journey for for the before and after, like Lisa was talking about, in companies where they have been siloed and then they're being particle accelerated together. Uh, <laughs> and it's like being tapped on the shoulder and saying, hey, did you know you're self-empowered now? That doesn't work that way. To make that journey, you have to be extremely deliberate and you have to be aware that it is not a straightforward line and that you may never get to the destination because people have adapted to the situation that you've put them in. They may not be willing to adapt to a different one, which is what you're asking them to be in. And so I think on average, uh, I hear a lot of striving for teams filled with T-shaped people, or maybe you could say uh, Kent Beck's new metaphor, the paint drip person where the paint goes across and it drips wherever it drips, and those are the places that you investigate further. I don't think companies have gotten good at reminding people that they are already T-shaped and they are already paint drip people, and we would actually like to be the kind of place where you feel comfortable growing in those regards. It doesn't happen as often as I would like. Yeah, it's, that's a good way to put it. And uh, for all of our waterfall friends out there, I'm, I was not attacking waterfall. I think, uh, I think Lisa's absolutely right. Many of the practices we pulled forward came from the waterfall era. And, and, and to say era is even wrong. It's still, still going on today. Uh, those teams shipped back in the day. We're just shipping in a different way. When, when, when my daughter is working on a development team someday, she's going to la- look back and say, Daddy, Agile was silly. Because there's going to be some other, some other highly collaborative, uh, highly innovative, highly team-centric way to, to deliver that we haven't even thought of yet. So, and I hope she does that. That'll be a fun little episode. We'll get you guys back and let her make fun of us for a little bit. Ryan, I hope you raise your daughter to look for things to appreciate in Waterfall and Agile <laughs> and whatever else comes between now and her exactly. developerhood. Yes. Well, well, I hope she, I really hope she looks back and says, why did y'all give that thing a name? It was just doing a good job of developing software. Absolutely. Well, that's actually something that Kent Beck said to me back in, I'm going to say 2001, I met him at a conference. And he's, and back then we didn't have the term, it was before we had the term Agile, so it was still the XP days. And I, you know, one of the questions I asked him is, you know, this name Extreme Programming, it just it doesn't sell. <laughs> <laughs> you know, people don't know what it is, and um, and he said, that, "Yeah, extreme programming. It's maybe not the best name, but but I hope in ten years people would just say, let's do a great job of 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 developing software. Let's do a better job. Let's let's continually improve, and that's really what it's all about." And I thought, well, that makes sense. And unfortunately, that didn't happen. We got the label Agile, and it has really stuck. And now it's late. It's burdened with all these. Failures and people who were doing "quote unquote" agile projects, right? Uh, just like every other thing we've been through in the last three decades. So, you know, I'm um, optimistic though, and my optimism comes from how much the retrospective has become a first class citizen in our work. And I think that if we can keep that, because Lisa, I, I, I think you're right. Agile as a term has been overloaded, destroyed. It's it's a poison word in, in a lot of conversations, but. If we keep the retro and if we keep innovating and, and moving the ball forward on what we're doing, I think we'll eventually get to the point where, like you said, it is just doing a good job and we're continually finding better ways to just do a good job. And, and, and I, I hope that continues. If, if we get out of the agile era, you know, the air quote agile era, and we lost the retrospective and we lost the ability to inspect and adapt, I think that will actually be a signal uh, of a huge fail- failure of at least this phase of, of, of development. And conversely, in the small, uh, it's not just Agile as an umbrella term that maybe doesn't help us pick the right things to do. Even, for example, if I think it would be useful for us to, let's try working on this problem all together at the same time, maybe at one computer, take some turns. Saying it that way works a lot better sometimes than saying there's this thing called mobbing Right. That you may, now that you've heard a name for it, feel negative toward. Right. No, let, me just, let me just say the behavior that I would like us to try, and let's see yep. if we want to try it. And then later, we can, we can talk that it's got a name. That's a great idea, actually. I like that. So maybe, Amitai, the next talk that, uh, that you pair up with someone on is, it's, a, it's an agile talk, but you never use the word agile or a name for any of the practices. You just talk behavior. Sounds good to me. I'll need to pair with my wife, who is the PhD animal behaviorist in the family. <laughs> awesome. That sounds like a winner. Well, at this point, Lisa, we've hit our time box, 
and being the good agilists that we are, uh, I think we respect the time box. And at this point of the show, this is the opportunity to promote uh, anything that you have going on to give the listeners an opportunity to, well, what am I doing? You, you're a listener of the show. You know what to do here. <laughs> well, what am I doing? Um, it, well, obviously working on this video course with Janet, which will be out, we're told will be out in May. So look for that on, I think it'll be on Inform IT. Um, but you can just look at my website, lisachrisman.com, and I'm sure I will be announcing it as well. Um, and I'm Lisa Crispin on Twitter, and I love to hear from people and um, to contact me through that through there or email me whatever it is because uh, I love to hear I love to have discussions about agile testing and donkeys and lots of other things and uh, I don't have any conferences I think I'm at the Mile High Conference nice. here in Denver which is I think at the beginning of May into April beginning of May and with presenting with Joelle and Carter on API testing it's really more Really more her session. I'm just helping out. And I will be a stalwart at Agile 2017. I'm very excited about that. And uh, Agile testing days in November in Germany, which is the most awesome testing conference ever. Very good. I'm a tie. What are you peddling this week, sir? Uh, this week I'm peddling sadness that I will probably not be able to go back to Agile Testing Days this year. I was very happy to be there last year at Lisa's suggestion. Uh, this year I will probably be very confused about which way is up that time of year because of the baby. But uh, what I have coming up before then is probably my last conferences for a little while. Uh, in Boston, April 19th through 21st is the Agile Alliance Technical Conference. I'll have a workshop there. Also DevOps themed. I seem to be becoming an expert about that, question mark. Uh, and then uh, Ann Arbor, May 4th and 5th, is Agile and Beyond with a workshop about uh, distributed Agile and pairing and mobbing in a context like that. And I would like to draw your attention, listener, if you have a chance to consider going to self-conference, which I will not be at this year, but I have spoken at, I have attended. Uh, they build themselves as a mix of fantastic tech presentations and insightful soft talks. And that is in Detroit, May 19th and 20th. And if you get in touch with me at Schmanz on Twitter and schmanz.com, I can give you 10% off your ticket. So please get in touch. I will get links to all of those items in the show notes. So everything that Lisa and Amitai have going on uh, and the ways to contact them, we will get uh, all of that posted. As for me, your host, Ryan Ripley, I am not going to promote anything this episode. I think it's just a... It was just a nice discussion around agile testing. It's a topic that I am not an expert on. This is one of the gaps that I've identified in kind of my agile journey that I'm I'm working to uh, to improve. And so I'll definitely be checking out Lisa's video series when it comes out. I'll definitely be rereading uh, both uh, of her wonderful books. I think uh, those two, uh, along with a few other friends of the show. I know Bob Galen's been on, and he's been instrumental in in helping. Uh, at least me through his books and some conversations get uh, more into the testing uh, mindset. So lots of work going on at, at personally for me in that space, but uh, I'll get links to the books and, and all those things in the show notes. So anyone else looking to take on that journey with me, uh, please feel free to jump in. It's an important topic that uh, probably gets overlooked far too many times. So it's one that, that I'm certainly focused on. With that said, Lisa and Amitai, thank you so much for joining me and to the listener Thank you for listening. We love that you're here. Uh, the numbers, the download numbers are always uh, going up, which means that all of you are sharing the show. And that is the, the single best way to help support the show is to share it with your friends. Tell them how much you're getting out of it. And uh, that just helps the, the listener base grow. So thank you for that. And uh, that's all that we have for this week's episode of Agile for Humans. I'm your host, Ryan Ripley, saying have a great night. Thanks for listening to Agile for Humans. Let's keep the conversation going. Drop us a question on Twitter at Agile for Humans or visit agileforhumans.com.